Thank you, and thanks, uh, Neil. I'm going to pick up uh, more or less where Neil left off with the third chapter of Seriola here. I'm going to be talking about Seriola Lalande and Dorsalis. Uh, Dorsalis, uh, I'll describe the difference here shortly. Um, but we're doing a lot of work with Seriola Dorsalis in San Diego at Hub C World Research Institute. So just to, there's been some confusion about which fish is which fish. Uh, fairly recently, the Southwest Fisheries Science Center did some genetics work on various Seriola lalandi, previously known as lalandi, uh, from around the world, and uh, they distinguished them as three different species. The Northwest Pacific stock in Asia was uh, recategorized as Seriola arabitata. Ar I think I got that right. Um, the stock that we work with it in uh, California and in Baja is uh, Soriola dorsalis, and uh, the South Pacific, South African, Australian, New Zealand, Chile, Chilean stock is uh, Seriola lalandi still. And if you have any questions about that, Catherine is right over there, and she can uh, <laughs> give you more information on that. Uh, it's just a brief history on the culture, both research and uh, commercial on the species here. Um, between 2000 and 2009, um, there's a few groups working on this. Hub Sea World Research Institute began its work early in that period with Dorsalis. Clean Seas in Australia um, began working with uh, Cyrilla Lalandi, and uh, Niwa in New Zealand uh, began working with Cyrilla Lalandi. Um, and more recently, in the last uh, nine years or so, uh, Hub Sea World continued work with Dorsalis and uh, also, I'll, I'll mention some of the work, uh, some of the commercial work um, that hubs uh, that we've done there later on in the presentation. Uh, a, a relatively new group, Baja Seas, which is now owned by a company called Selecta in uh, northern Baja. They have a hatchery in northern Baja and a grow out site in southern Baja. Uh, they began working with Dorsalis, that, uh, their initial stock actually we provided from hubs and uh, they stocked in their, in their cage systems. And they also sourced some larvae from Chile, so they have both species in culture there, and they're continuing that work. Um, Aquinor in Chile has done a lot of hatchery work and I believe some pilot grow out work. Uh, Clean Seas in, in Australia continuing to work with Lalande. Uh, there's a relatively new group uh, in the Netherlands called Kingfish Zealand that has uh, Serilla Lalanda, and I believe they source those fish from the Chilean stock. Um, and uh, I'll mention them in a, in a bit also. Uh, there's also uh, Cadia Harvest in Maine, uh, which is, uh, I'll mention uh, soon, it's a land-based uh, facility. And uh, finally, New Zealand, uh, Niwa, if there are any New Zealanders in here, please don't throw any uh, tomatoes up at the stage. That should say New Zealand after Niwa, um, sensitive topic. And they're continuing their work with Lalandai. Um, a bit on the technical end of things, broodstock, uh, they've, uh, they've been raised in tanks varying in size from every, as small as 10 cubic meters to 140 cubic meters. Um, we've worked with various sizes at Hub SeaWorld. Um, both wild and captive bred fish have been used as broodstock. Um, and given their natural photothermal conditions, they'll spawn roughly six months out of the year, temperatures between 15 and 24. Um, within that spawning season, they'll spawn continuously. Uh, depending on the family, gr the group, they can spawn anywhere from once or twice to three or four times per week uh, per tank. They've been uh, successfully bred in both recirc and flow-through systems. They require excellent water quality and, uh, and a, a high-quality diet. Bait fish, uh, sardines, mackerel, squid, some supplements have been used uh, from various manufacturers, but there is no commercially uh, spirulous commercially available cereal specific diet um, to up until, yep. Um, ongoing research with broodstock, selective breeding, looking at parentage, cold tolerance, uh, which would be a benefit uh, in, in certain parts of the world. Um, uh, recently we we're, we're, uh, got funding to install a photothermal control um, broodstock tank at hubs and we'll be doing some work with off-season spawning. Um, but that has been achieved in other parts of the world with the species. Um, always looking towards improving nutrition, leading to better egg quality and uh, disease management. Larval rearing, um, been quite successful in this regard uh, in recent years. Uh, typical stocking densities are 50 to 100 eggs per liter. 
uh, temperatures around 22 degrees Celsius. Uh, we're using 24 hour photo period uh, with fairly high light intensity um, for the first couple of weeks of culture. Um, green, standard green water methods using algae paste from 3 to 12 days post hatch. And generally, we have them weaned um, to a formulated diet by 35 days post hatch. And we're getting some really good survival rates. Um, between 30 and 60 percent is typical for us. We've gotten as high as 63 percent, I think, is our record uh, from larvae of one gram juvenile. And you can see a pretty standard uh, uh, f uh, calendar for feeding uh, rotifers for a few days. And around s uh, seven or eight days post hatch, we transition to uh, artemia. and. Uh, a fairly long weaning period starting around 15 or 16 days post hatch. Um, ongoing research uh, in larva culture, always trying to improve on production costs, uh, working on improving uh, feed efficiency, reducing uh, labor costs through automation, such as a self cleaning tank you see pictured there. Um, always trying to improve survival so you get more yield out of each specific larval tank, and that reduces the cost of production. Um, always working to improve nutrition, reduce malformations. Uh, one of the topics that uh, we're still working on is swim bladder inflation. We've gotten, we've gotten some good results. We've also seen uh, uh, some poor swim bladder inflation in some tanks, and uh, we're working to improve that. Um, decreased disease incidence uh, through better management of microbiology. We fortunately don't see epitheliocystis, which uh, Neil mentioned, which is one of the benefits of this species. That's a, that's a tough one. Uh, within the nursery, um, we generally speaking, we uh, systems have run in, we, I'd call that a fairly uh, medium density, 20 kilos per cubic meter is fairly common. I've seen higher densities in, in some systems with the species. Um, we generally expect fairly high survival, 90% plus is, is typical in nursery systems. Um, but it is space intensive, uh, similar to Rivoliana, it's very oxygen intensive. Um, and labor intensive, cleaning, hand grading fish for malformations, uh, transporting them is not easy because of their high oxygen requirement. Um, but high quality feeds are available for nursery diets, um, and we typically get the fish to around 30 grams in, in a month, depending on temperature and densities. Um, some of the ongoing research in nursery sized fish is, again, working on reducing production costs, uh, improving the quality of the fish through. Uh, better health. Uh, some groups um, are working on vaccination. Um, and depending on uh, what your grow out systems are, is looking to really identify what the best stocking size is for fish, uh, which can vary depending on if it's a land based system or what your temperatures offshore are, conditions, etc. Um, I won't go too much into disease control and prevention. Um, uh, both Kevin and Neil mentioned uh, the, the skin fluke issue that's similar in these cereal as well. Uh, we also have seen some gill flukes and various uh, other uh, parasites which haven't been terribly prob problematic. Um, now uh, bacterial infections, we really haven't seen anything specifically and uh, continuously affecting the fish, generally opportun opportunistic if densities get too high or, or management issues. Um, we have been able to control most of our disease issues with uh, available treatments in the U.S., peroxide for, for, and formalin for ectoparasites, and uh, we haven't had to use any uh, antibiotics at hubs, but these have been used for the species elsewhere. Um, other disease management solutions, uh, the copper ally mesh, which I'm sure most of you have heard about, that's a really big step forward uh, for the grow out of these, this, these species. Um, Selective breeding is something that would certainly uh, should be on, in everyone's plan for disease resistance in the future. Vaccination work, immunostimulants, and best management practices, just keeping densities in check and high feed quality, et cetera. Um, I'll go into the grow out now. Uh, this species has been successfully produced in both land and cage based systems. Um, I'll get into some examples of this in the following slides. Um, Growth rates and FCR are variable, but uh, under the right conditions, you can achieve four kilo fish in less than two years. And FCRs below 1.5 have definitely uh, are, is achi are achievable. 
Uh, this is a growth curve uh, that we've projected for uh, Southern California, that the uh, temperature curve there, if you guys can make out the blue line, uh, we'll typically see temperatures ranging from 13, 14 degrees Celsius in the winter up to 23, 24 in the summer. Um, so that shows what the growth would be of a, of a batch of fish stocked in uh, kind of late spring and get up to four kilos and I think that's about 20 months or so in that graph. So a little bit about land-based RAS. This is still not um, proven uh, economic success, but there are some groups that are getting into this. Um, Acadia Harvest in Maine, and from what I understand, uh, they're currently in a fundraising state, but uh, they definitely are looking towards pro uh, installing a large land-based production system. Kingfish Zealand is a relatively new player in the Netherlands, and they're currently constructing a facility, from what I understand, is going to be up to a 6,000 metric ton production. And they're looking for, um, they're looking for uh, future expansion plans up to 10,000 metric tons in the U.S., as they claim. Um, in cage systems, uh, Baja Seas has uh, done some small-scale production, about under 1,000 metric tons or so. And Clean Seas in Australia has been producing for a number of years. And recently, they published um, uh, that they, uh, actually last year they had a, a 2,600 ton production level and a profit of two and a half million dollars. And they're looking for further expansion and selling the product between 10 to 12 dollars a kilo. Uh, quickly, grow out feed, very important. Um, the quality is very, uh, the critical part of growing these fish. Um, down below is a, an example of when a poor quality feed was used in South Australia Taurine deficient feed caused high levels of mortality, up to 80% of their fish they lost in their offshore systems. Once they corrected that, uh, they got into uh, acceptable levels of mortality. And finally here, primary impediments to commercialization. They're not necessarily impediments, but some of the research and uh, goals that we have. Swim bladder inflation in the hatchery, off-cycle production, selective breeding. Uh, in the garage and land base is looking for investment. Uh, uh, and also finding land with seawater access and proving out the concept. And offshore disease management will always be in, in uh, uh, ongoing uh, research. And most importantly, as everyone's referred to already, is enabling the U.S. to grow these fish offshore permit acquisition. And my last slide here, um, this is something that we're working on at Hub SeaWorld, uh, partnering with some, some uh, great investors. Uh, we're in the process of trying to acquire permits to four or 5,000 metric ton production, uh, offshore production system off the coast of San Diego. And that's it. Thank you.